This is Neil Patori. In this segment, I'm going to talk about Intro to Quadrature Amplitude Modulation, or QAM. As we talked about, a modulation has basis functions that we need to specify, and it has symbols that we need to list. So first, we'll specify that QAM has two basis functions, phi0 of t and phi1 of t. So the first basis function is has an amplitude of square root of two. It's a pulse shape, P of T. And that pulse shape, I'll mention this um, in more detail later, but the pulse shape meets the Nyquist filtering theorem. It is pretty low pass. It's pretty low in frequency compared to a mega naught. And that pulse shape is multiplied by the cosine of a mega naught T for the phi zero of T. And for the phi one of T, it is multiplied by the sine of a mega naught T. There is a minus sign multiplying the square root of 2 and the phi 1 of t. And when we get to complex baseband, we'll talk about why we chose to put a minus sign here. 2 pi omega naught is our frequency in hertz. And that frequency is going to be generally pretty high. For wireless communications, our kind of standard minimum frequency is on the order of megahertz. Megahertz is 10 to the 6th. And we go up to the gigahertz, which is 10 to the 9th. And um, we will even be in the tens of gigahertz for communications systems um, that are commonly used. So that is up to about 10 to the 10th. So this is a pretty high frequency compared to how quickly the PFT changes. Okay, this is figure 5.15 from the Rice book. If we were to imagine that our pulse shape was this red line, kind of follows this bell-shaped curve drawn here. This isn't doesn't happen to be a Nyquist filtering shape, but just imagine that was our P of T. Once we multiply that P of T with a cosine or a sine wave, it's going to take this blue line shape, which you can see contains many, many, many cycles of a sinusoid. The only way we can really tell what P of T is by looking at the amplitude, the maximum of the peaks of this sinusoid or cosine. We also call this the envelope of this signal. And if I were to zoom in very closely on any little segment of this blue line, I'd see it looks like a sinusoid. It has a slowly varying amplitude that is pretty much constant within any period. That being said, there are lots of modulations that could be described by these two orthogonal basis functions. It all depends on their list of their m possible symbols. And we've used sm of t to describe that. This is one of the, this is the mth possible symbol. And we also describe the nth possible symbol as a vector with the first amplitude and the second amplitude as a two element vector. Now, we're gonna name many different varieties of how we can uh, put these symbols onto a constellation diagram. Remember, our constellation diagram is this plot of the amplitude for phi zero and the amplitude of phi one on the two axes and our capital M points will be drawn in here as vectors. So for square quam, we would draw a grid of symbols, capital M symbols, in a square. This would be an example of 16 square quam. And we're naming it square just because I've arranged the points on a grid that is four by four, that is a square evenly spaced along the x-axis and evenly spaced along the, the y-axis. I can have any value of quam with m equal to two to some even power, where a is an even number. And I would get be able to put all of my uh, symbol points on a grid. If I had uh, a odd, I had m equals 2 to the a. I could still have some kind of pattern. I might have a rectangle. Here would be 
m equals 8 rectangular pam. And this would be 8 rectangular quam. We can also arrange constellation points in other ways. Again, note that all of these constellations are centered at zero. That is, the average of the m symbol vectors is zero. Here you can see that this uh, center point is not at the origin because this point here on the left would make it uh, unbalanced. It would make it have a non-zero center if I were to put this point at the origin. So that's why it's shifted a little bit to the right. We'll talk about average symbol energy in another video segment. Another subset of QAM constellations is called phase shift keying, or PSK. And these are so common and so important that we're going to have a special name for them. Um, we can have different values of m, um, any even number or any, any uh, power of 2 for PSK, but in reality I've really only seen m equals 4 or m equals 8 PSK. Um, m equals 4 is called QPSK, or Quadrature Phase Shift King. The idea with PSK is that all of the symbol vectors have the same length. That is, their constellation lies on a circle. And that circle has some set radius, and all of the points would be on this circle. So this would be 8 PSK. And 4 PSK we would pick four of these points that are furthest apart. We could do either the ones that are at 45 degrees, 135 degrees, 225 degrees, and minus 45 degrees. We could do that. Or we could pick the ones on the axes. Either way is equivalent. So again, centered at zero, and the amplitude in PSK is the same. And that's the reason why we do PSK would be because the symbol amplitude is always about the same, it makes amplifiers able to be a little bit more efficient. We have other uh, modulations which are called amplitude phase shift king, or APSK. All symbol points are on a small number of circles centered at the origin, instead of just one circle like PSK. And Rice figure 5.19 plots a couple of these different PSK modulations. You can see that the characteristics would need to be specified, but these are also used to try to balance that trade-off between having um, some symbols at equal amplitudes and um, minimizing average symbol energy. So why would we pick different constellations over each other? Because of energy efficiency, because of probability of error, and because of the complexity of transmitting and receiving each modulation. Each modulation would be different on these three characteristics, and we would then make some choice based on our design, based on our engineering specification for our link. And that's what we're going to talk about over the course of the next several lectures, is how do we characterize both the energy efficiency and probability of error, as well as take into consideration other complexity or ease of implementation of the transmitter and receiver for these different modulations.